Hi, I'm Monica Weitzel, and welcome to Community Hotline. Today, we'll be sharing a little bit about what's going on in your community. Larry Smith will tell us how the Multnomah County Fair is providing a new pandemic modified experience. We'll also be chatting with the new mayor of Troutdale, Randy Lauer. And in recognition of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, we'll talk with Duncan Wong of Apano. It's all coming up next on Community Hotline. The Multnomah County Fair has been going strong since 1906, and despite the challenges of the last year, it continues its rich tradition this Memorial Day weekend. With us today is Larry Smith, president of the Multnomah County Fair Board. Welcome, Larry. Well, thank you, Monica. It's great to see you again. So we're going to start out with just a rapid fire round of questions. And um, are you ready? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> okay, thanks. So Larry, what is your favorite aspect of the fair? I just think that the whole idea of it's the, the community coming together and, and it's a family affair. We've got four generations of, of one family working, a grandmother, great-grandmother, mother, and children wow. uh, that bring exhibits. So uh, what, what is a brand new offering that you can tell us about at the fair this year? Well, one thing we've never tried before is live streaming some of the events to our website. So we're going to be doing that. And uh, regardless of how the pandemic restrictions are, we'll be able to at least uh, send some of it out to the community. If, the, if people can't come to us, we will send the fair to them. Great. So where and when is the fair? This year it's on Mar Memorial Day weekend, which is going to be just two days this year, May 29th and 30th. Okay. And that's at Oaks Park? It is at Oaks Park. And okay. the, the main part of it is going to be in the historic dance pavilion. That's the Great. exhibit hall. Great. So uh, can you list a few of the things that people can expect to see at the fair this year, since it'll be a little different? Yeah, it's a little different. We've we've got to go with whatever Oaks Park uh, tells us we can do, and they have to go with the, the state guidelines. So we've got our uh, traditional competitions in, see if I can get them all in one, one thought, arts, crafts, fiber arts, which is textiles, floral and garden, photography and foods. And we'll be having our uh, traditional uh, competitions. People will, will be able to bring in, in their exhibits on May 28th, Friday, and they will be judged on Saturday. Great, that sounds like fun. So uh, why should people go to the fair? It's just, it's one of those time, time traditions that we've been going, this is going to be number 115 and uh, Oaks Park, of course, they will have to, uh, make sure that they follow all the guidelines, but they will be open to some extent. So we'll be able to also enjoy the midway rides and the other Oaks Park attractions. And I hope the weather holds. So if you were to make up an official slogan for the fair, what would it be? Well, uh, could I go to? Because sure, two, go to, one, go of them, to. one of them would be we're bulletproof. <laughs> After this last year, we actually had a, a a fair last year it was called we call it the virtual fair we made a video of it and that is available if you want to take a look at our website but our official uh, theme is honoring those who serve and especially mm. this year when we're talking about not just the medical workers but the transit workers the grocery workers everybody who has gotten us through this pandemic we want to honor them great thanks larry that that look, gives us something to look forward to can you tell me a little bit more about why you've been involved for so long? I know as a president of the board, you're very busy. And, and uh, what do you get out of it and what makes it worthwhile to you? I started participating in fairs when I was 10 years old and now I'm 65. So do the math. It actually is 1967. And at, at one point, someone said, you know, you've been involved in enough fairs in in an different ones around the area, they, they kind of, they call me the carpet bagger because I go to other fairs other than my own county. And somebody said, you know, you know fairs well enough, you would probably be a good board member. And I thought, great, I'll be a board member. And one day, maybe I'll even be president. Well, the next year, the president resigned. Here there I am. you are. Here I am. <laughs> and how long has it been? Six years, I think. Six years, yeah, yeah. You'll be in it for another ten. Um, <laughs> tell me, uh, tell me what else people should know about the Multnomah County Fair this year. Is there anything we've left out? 
it is one of the the very few events that are actually going to be held and we've got some of the uh, news stations coming out to do some promos for us the, on their actual news stations and one person said it best it's like any event going on at this time is news. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So you're bringing news to the Pacific Northwest here. So everybody needs to go out and check out the Maloma County Fair on Memorial Day weekend in Oaks Park. And we will be able to uh, know closer to the date of the fair how many people we can actually let in. And we believe we're going to have a ticketing system at on the Oaks Park website to oh, make a reservation. We have to do that this year. And that's okay. So on the information will be on our website. Thank you, Larry, so much for giving us this information about the Multnomah County Fair. People can check it out at Oaks Park on Memorial Day weekend and check out your website for, for more information. Thanks very much for all you're doing for the community. Thank you. And thank you to Metro East for all you're doing for the community. <laughs> Take care, Larry. And to all of our viewers out there, be sure to check out the Multnomah County Fair. In the meantime, be safe and stay healthy. Have you ever visited Troutdale, Oregon? It's the cutest little town at the entrance to the Columbia Gorge. And there's a new mayor in town. What does he have up his sleeve for the future of this scenic region? Today we'll meet Troutdale's mayor, Randy Lauer, and find out what he envisions for the city. Randy Lauer, welcome to Community Hotline. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Monica. I uh, appreciate the time. No problem. So uh, as a new mayor of uh, Troutdale, can you tell me what your vision is for Troutdale? Like, what do you, what do you want the image, the public image of Troutdale to be? I want Troutdale to, first and foremost, to remain Troutdale. I want us to really dive into the intricacies and the wonderful things that make us who we are out here, far out here in East County. Um, you know, I want us to have that identity that sets us apart from the other counties and or the other cities in Multnomah County and the other cities in East County, you know, Gretchen, right. wonderful. Wood Village is wonderful. Fairview is wonderful. But I want people to think of, you know, a small town um, neighborhood feeling with wonderful store shop owners and uh, just a really tranquil place to be when they think of Troutdale. And I want that to set us apart uh, moving forward. That's a good image to have, I think. I mean, right now we're, we're just in this boom of development for Troutdale standards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, we want to make sure that we're doing it right. Yeah. So just yeah. Keeping, keeping intact the, the history and, and everything that's made us so wonderful up to date and just keep that in the, in the forefront when we when we decide where we want to go in the future. Okay. You, you said you were talking about development and I... Um... I remember uh, going down to Cannon Beach when it was very small and getting bigger and bigger and about how they set um, city ordinances where they, they couldn't go too high and they couldn't have too many um, chain restaurants and that kind of thing. I mean, are you looking at doing some of those things to keep that small town feel? We already have certain codes in place uh, with our development that um, certain sectors of the city were not, you know, we're not allowing developers to come in and, and, and go so many stories high. Um, what we okay, don't want to do, yeah, what we what we don't want to do is block um, anybody's potential view of right. Gorge East or you know the hills of Washington looking north. And so yeah. um, we have those already set in place. But um, with any any type of future development, there's always that um, there's always a level of uh, security built in. That might not be the right word but um, control that the council has with uh, bringing in certain types of development and all those rules that we have in place, we can go back and, and relook. And if there's just something that just fits so wonderful in Troutdale that just kind of just sets it apart from everything else, we have the ability to go back and make adjustments to some okay. of those rules. Yeah. So yeah. again, looking forward, but doing things um, with a, with keeping Troutdale in mind first. Good, good. So keep it, keep it like it is, but, but just make it even better. Yeah. So I know there's, um, there is a lot of construction going on. There's a, the Halsey corridor, which I know you share with um, other, other cities out there. There's a new development that's going on just south, I think, of the Columbia Gorge Outlet Mall. Um, it, it's directly east. So tell me a little bit about that. What is that going to be? So 
so that land, it's um, just over 20 acres. It was uh, at one point in time, it was the city's wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. So it's been about 20 years since it's been the wastewater treatment plant. So within those two decades, it sat and just dilapidated. So oh. one of my goals when I came on as council, as a city councilor back in 2015, was to get some sort of decision made on what the city was going to do with that land back there. Because it was just, it was just a blight. It was just, it was bringing down the north section of our town center in the city of Troutdale. And so um, one thing that we did was go ahead and acquire the all of the land from the previous owner that had it. Um, it's now in our sole control. And we have went through the lengthy process of getting it ready, getting everything decommissioned, um, everything taken out that was a hazard, uh, the correct way working with DEQ and getting it to a place now where we can actually start talking to developers to help help act to, to help bring our vision to a reality. And so that's what I talk about when we have development here in Troutdale. What we're hoping to do with this development is not only not only grab onto things that are um, easy targets, low hanging fruit right now, but to think, you know, what transcends us where we're at right now and people that when they come to Troutdale, when our kids grow up, when our kids have kids and they want to go downtown and do things that they're going to appreciate what we did here back in the early 2020s. And so, You're really doing this for your family and for the other families that, that oh, live absolutely. there and will live there. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. just so whatever we are going to do is something that we're thinking of further on down the line and not just uh, what's affecting us right now. So not, not what's going to put the most money in your pockets now, but what will be good for the future of the city. I mean, exactly. that's, that's exactly. important. Exactly. Yeah. What we want people to come and enjoy when they come and visit Troutdale. Yep. And I understand you are going to be taking advantage of the fact that there's a lot of bicyclists that come through town as well. Is that yeah, right? yeah. We were a part of the, the Gorge Hub project, and that, that is pulling together a lot of the cities along the, along the 84 corridor and the Halsey corridor. And so um, we're, we're getting certain development aspects that will give uh, easier spots for cyclists as they make their way up uh, east and west along the gorge to, to have a pit stop, to have a place to sit, to have a place to rehydrate, to have a place to maybe fix a flat tire. And so... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're excited about that project as well. Good, good. There's a lot of fun stuff going on. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the other cities um, uh, and the, the work that's going along the Halsey corridor. You, I assume you're working with the other cities on the stuff that's going on there. Uh, how, how, do, how, do you, how do you work with the other cities? Is that, is that, is that a good uh, process, a good partnership? It's, it's a good partnership. What I am going to say that it is difficult and it's not difficult because of differing opinions or anything along that nature. It's difficult because when it comes down to it, we are three separate and it's Troutdale, Fairview and Wood Village. Mm -hmm. So three separate cities. Uh, we share that responsibility with Metro and Multnomah County. And it's difficult because we are three separate entities with three separate um, codes, three separate mm -hmm three separate ideas of what we want this corridor to be. So it's difficult in that, but it brings together a lot of wonderful conversations. So even though Troutdale has its own vibe and Wood Village in, in between the three cities has its own vibe and Fairview has its own vibe, we can come together on a, some sort of a, to agree upon some sort of color palette, if you will. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily it has to do with the paint, just, just a generic example, a color palette that we can agree on that we can take this palette and from there we can we can develop for the future basically what our storefronts and what our Halsey corridor looks like in each of these cities with that color palette being the base of that development. So um, it's kind of what we're talking about right now is, is deciding uh, uh, what what that color palette should be yeah. uh, moving forward. So something that will kind of tie you at all all together, but keep you unique in your own in your own cities. Exactly, like a jumping off point. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that's great. I like that. Um, and there's some good people working in all those. All those there's styles. great people, yeah. and that's, that's one of the things. Um, when I was elected mayor, that was one of the things that I wanted to do with um, my four years in office is to grow and and build upon those relationships that we have with other uh, other municipalities and other other partners that we have like Metro and Multnomah County, you know, it's, yeah. 
things are changing right now and we want to make sure that we're in those conversations and, and having our voice heard and just be a part of, of the change and, and yeah. as positive as we can. So sure. um, it, this committee is like the Halsey Corridor Committee is another way of us getting, getting involved in there regionally. Good, good. So, uh, so that's a very positive thing. What about, what about, what are some of the difficult issues that you find you'll be facing here as mayor? Uh, what are some of the, the troublesome issues that you have to deal with? Right now, we're obviously like everybody else in the world. Um, we're having to deal with the um, the, the COVID nineteen pandemic and everything coming along with that. Um, we're having to deal with the uh, restrictions and shutdowns mandated by the governor. Um, I have a lot of stores and a lot of shops and a lot of restaurants on our main street that are that are struggling and have been struggling since since last year. And so, you know, that's not going away anytime soon. The the um, the ramifications from all the shutdowns and from the virus. Um, aren't going to go away anytime soon. So that's going to be something that I think we'll, we'll all be dealing with throughout these next three and a half years, how much ever left is on my term. We're coming at it more from an economic standpoint, what we can do as a city, what we can do as an elected body to help um, prop up the businesses that have been struggling so hard, but also um, try to encourage other businesses to come into Troutdale at the same time. So we're having, we're having this conversation on two fronts holding up the businesses we have, but then also encouraging other ones to come into town. And so that's something that even without the pandemic, uh, we would have focused on. Uh, we're just having to focus on it a little bit more now. Um, but it's it's good work that needs to happen. Well, it's, it does make it a little more challenging, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's. I was really excited to focus on um, our development site at the Confluence right behind the outlet mall. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was something that I think we can all be proud of when we get to a point where we actually have a plan. And now it's not taking a back seat by any means. It's super important and it will be in the forefront of everything we do, but everything else now is coming on from all angles and it's, it's just taking time away from other things. But like I said, it's an important, it's an important fight that we have in front of us and one that'll, that'll hopefully, you know, reinvigorate our, our city and the region as a whole. So, so the, the long-term, uh, long-term benefits will, will hopefully outweigh the, the pain of getting there. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. 100%. So um, what about other issues like um, homelessness, which is something that we're all facing no matter where we live, it seems like. Um, is that uh, something that you're, you intend to deal with in, in one way or another? Yeah, yeah, we, we're having um, a significant increase in uh, crime that we have downtown and uh, a lot of it is coming from um, the state park that we have just north of our city limits. That's the Sandy River Delta Park. Um, it's commonly referred to as Thousand Acres Dog Park out here by Trout Aliens. And so we've, we've been so fortunate to have that park in our backyard for so many years, for so long. And it's just been a wonderful, a wonderful place for people to go and unwind and, and walk their dogs and just enjoy being out in the, in the nature of of the uh, river, but after you know the the past few years, the the homeless problem that's been hitting hard in Multnomah County and everywhere um, really took hold inside of the Sandy River Delta Park. So we're having to deal with the repercussions of that and the ramifications of having all those people in there that are just you know absolutely destroying the the natural spaces that is supposed to be for everybody and. Um, the difficult part is we don't own the land. Um, we are, uh, it's owned by the uh, Department of State Lands and the Department of Forestry. Most of the problems that are happening in the Department of Forestry land. And so we're, we're in talks with the Department of Forestry, with the Department of State Lands, uh, Metro and Multnomah County to try to come together to have these conversations to find a solution to what's happening in there. You know, it's not necessarily... The, the, the hard thing with homelessness is it's not a one problem issue. It's, it's a nuanced problem that has so many different factors involved with it. So yes, uh, affordable housing could help, but attacking and helping the ones with uh, mental difficulties, the ones with um, drug and alcohol addiction, the ones that just are passing through and, and had nowhere else to go on their travels, um, helping those answering, trying to answer those questions 
I think is going to help this problem um, really try to curtail the problem. And it's, you know, it's difficult when we try to talk to the other regional leaders um, and they just want to, they want to try to answer it by saying we just need more affordable housing. And really, you know, some of the, I work outside, I've been a utility worker for municipalities for the past 17 years. So I've ran, I've ran across multiple different types of people living on the streets. A lot of them, they, they do, they're down on their luck. They just need a, a helping hand, a guiding person or organization to show them to the affordable housing. The majority of people don't want to live in a house. They don't want to live in, within the rules that a city confines them in. They like living on the fringe. And the problem with that is they're not necessarily following the rules that the rest of us are having to, and they cut down trees and green spaces. They, they dump hazardous chemicals right on the riverbank and they're burning and it's just, it's, it's sad. And so these are the conversations that we need to have with these regional partners and we're moving along. I just got a, a letter that I'm sending off today to the, to the uh, legislature about helping us answer these problems. So hopefully we'll get, um, we'll get some responses and some, uh, some traction moving forward to help the people that are down there, but also to help the, the natural spaces that is just getting destroyed. We talked a little bit about how um, Trout dell has been uh, affected by the pandemic and everything, what you know, you're trying to do. What else do you think you might want to do for the, the citizens? Do you have any, any just ideas of your own that you think would be really something fun to add to the, to the city. I know you, you know, there's stuff for the kids and the adults and um, any other ideas that you're you having percolating in the back of your mind? <laughs> so I'm very glad you asked. So <laughs> one thing that, you know, I've come to realize living in Troutdale and, and being on city council for Troutdale is there's so many things for families to do. There's so many mm -hmm. things for adults to do. We have great restaurants, we have great shops. There's so many things for kids to do. We're so so lucky to have so many parks in Imagination Station uh, Part Two, and um, just we've we've invested so much on in the infrastructure of children at play, at um, uh, people to come and, and spend their money at, at the shops and restaurants we have. We really don't have anything for teenagers or young adults. We really don't. And so one thing I would love to get on the radar, which I'm go I'm going to be pressing it pretty hard next budget year is um, to get a skate park built for the, uh, the youth here in Troutdale. Gresham has a wonderful skate park. Um, there are cities all around Oregon that have wonderful skate parks. Redmond has a great park. Portland has a few dotted all around schools. Um, it's time that Troutdale invests in the, in the activities of the youth and gives them something that they can be proud of and call their own, um, something they can take ownership of. And I think, moving forward with a skate park would be fantastic. I used to skateboard when I was a kid. <laughs> Gresham and Troutdale. Uh, I bet you did. I, I, I just had a feeling you must have been a skateboarder. But, I, but you're right, because it, it also is a good thing to, ha to have things for kids to do, because otherwise, you know, it's yeah. just too many ways to get in trouble if you don't have something to do. So there's, I think a, that's, a, there's a saying that Grandpa Lauer always used to say, something about idle hands. So <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> If we had a really cool skate park, one that's um, out in the open, um, one that's well lit, one that is not off a side street or at the back of a park where people don't have to see it, one where one where the community can come out and see just how much our youth and our, our young adults would love to have this skate park. I think it would be such a positive thing. I would love. There's been a there's been an organization. Um, uh, spearheaded by a citizen. Um, his name's Tyler Cole. He's been trying to get a skate park for years now. Really? It's been on the council. It's been on the council budget for, I want to say, or council discussions, I want to say for almost, almost 15, 16 years, <laughs> 12, 12, 15 years, they've been talking about it. And so um, when I came in, that was one of the things that I would love to have done is, is finally get something, get Troutdale on the map, get something for the for the young adults to enjoy and, and really just check that off the list for Troutdale moving forward. I think it'd be great. Maybe it just needs a uh, mayor's backing and approval to get that going. Yeah, so yeah. I hope, I hope that'll happen. That sounds great. Um, you, um, you're, you're kind of a family man, aren't you? You have a family here in, in, and you're from Troutdale, right? Yeah, I have. Um, my family was, uh, I was born and raised in Gresham. Okay. My family grew up in Gresham. Uh, my grandparents and, uh, 
they own one of the first houses off Hensley in Troutdale. Um, my other grandparents worked at the Reynolds aluminum plant. Yeah. Um, they, they had a house in Wood Village. Um, my parents owned the house in Troutdale. And then when all the kids were, well, I'm all, ado I'm adopted. My, my brothers and sisters are adopted. Uh, I'm Latino. My sisters are Korean. My brother is Caucasian. And so we were all adopted. But once we all came, once the cornucopia of kids came, <laughs> um, they moved out of the little farmhouse in Troutdale and, and bought a house in Gresham. So we grew, we, I got East County through my- You're East County in your blood, don't you? My, yeah. Great yeah. grandparents went to Gresham. My grandparents, my parents, my brothers and sisters, we all went to Gresham High School. Um, so yeah, East County runs through me through and through. So yeah. Good. Well, I think, I think, uh, citizens did a good job in uh, voting you into this this position. I think you, you fit very well, you. Um, and and I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today and and uh, share your vision for Troutdale. So it sounds ambitious and it sounds doable, and I and I wish you the best of luck on that. Thanks Thank very you. much. Is there anything else you want to leave us with? Anything else we should know before I let you go today? Um, just that, just a word of encouragement. And you know, times are hard, times are difficult, but reach out to your neighbors, ask for help, make sure someone doesn't need help and really just realize we're gonna get through all this stuff, but we're gonna get through it a lot quicker together. So uh, just have some grace and, and uh, some good conversations. I like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to our viewers for watching today. So, you know, if you haven't been to Troutdale, you're missing out, better check it out. And for all of you out there, stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you next time. In recognition of Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we'll be featuring APANO. APANO is a statewide grassroots organization uniting Asians and Pacific Islanders to achieve social justice. Today, we'll be learning about how we can stand in solidarity against Asian hate and support our neighbors and our community. With us today is the Associate Director of APANO, Duncan Huang. Welcome, Duncan. It's good to have you here. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're welcome. So you've had a very busy year at Apano. Um, since this is Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month, we thought we'd check in with you and kind of find out what's what's on the forefront of your work this month or the month of May. What do you have going on? Um, well, I think over the last year, we've really been focusing on kind of two kind of big crises or um, I guess different types of pandemics. You know, I think we're working mm -hmm. on, of course, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and making sure our communities know like all that public health information they need. And over the last couple of months, really, you know, finding out about kind of the different vaccine opportunities that exist. Yeah. And then uh, really been shifting over to kind of the economic recovery. Um, you know, our communities were devastated about, I think, 26 percent of Asian American owned businesses nationwide um, closed due to the pandemic. Um, so I think that includes a lot of, you know, how do we get businesses back open? How do we get folks back to work? Um, so I think there's all that. And then over the last month, there's also been a pretty uh, pronounced spike in hate and bias crimes or incidents against our community as well. Um, probably, you know, due to the last couple of years and the narrative around the China virus or Wu flu and, and things like that. Yeah. So just responding to those kind of trio of, of uh, public health and um, I guess social justice yeah. uh, crises. Well, those are really big issues. I mean, they, those are the two biggest issues for every American, I think, this last year. But Absolutely. if you're one of the groups that have been, you know, personally affected, that's a much bigger thing. Um, so tell, let me start with the COVID uh, issue. How has Apano been able to help their, their people? I mean, you, you said you've like helping find vaccines. I mean, um, do you find your community as a whole, is it receptive to taking the vaccine? Kind of early on last year, we adapted a lot of our programming. Um, so it shifted a lot to first kind of meeting some basic needs. Uh -huh. um, so we are doing like rental assistance. Uh, we have a food security program. Um, and we're doing small business technical assistance and grants and things like that. Um, so I think those are very kind of like, you know, um, 
direct forms of assistance. Right, and we're also right. working on kind of a systemic level to make sure, um, you know, that public health officials are, are carefully considering kind of the needs in our community. You know, for example, Pacific Islander communities have COVID infection rates that were 12 times higher than in white communities. Um, it's huge. That's huge. It is, absolutely, yeah. So I think, you know, there's just kind of really kind of specific needs that that need to be addressed. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a big undertaking. Um, and I know lots of nonprofits have had to really switch and try to uh, accommodate you know, the needs of their, of, you know, the people they're serving um, in different ways. So that's, uh, but, but I know that you've kept very busy and have been really doing a good job from what I hear. I, you know, Thank I hear you. nothing but good, good things about Apano. Okay, um, that's very generous. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, well, you're welcome. It's, it's true. Um, then the other issue that you talked about was the, um, was the Asian hate crimes and the, and, you know, the proliferation of that. It's really, it's a shocking, but it's, it's what's happening. Um, and I've, I read a lot of stuff on your website. Um, there was a great blog. I can't remember if it was yours or if it was a, uh, a director, but it was really good about, about how, you know, how to deal with that. I'm wondering how, um, how you think the white community or just anybody in the community can better support uh, the, the Asian community and the Pacific Islanders. How, what, what, do, is there anything you can think of that would be a good practice or a good uh, route to take to, in order to support your community? Sure. Well, I think, you know, one of the first things is just, you know, getting educated on kind of like the historical legacy of racism against Asian Pacific Islanders. I think whenever, you know, folks in the United States kind of like come upon uh, difficult times, you know, we often seen, see a backlash, you know, against our community. Mm -hmm. So whether it was, you know, during World War II with the Japanese internment or in the 80s where, you know, folks maybe thought that Japanese automakers were overtaking American automakers to 9-11 to um, and then like the Muslim ban. So I think that that cycle of um, backlash has really kind of been present throughout, you know, our history and in Oregon in specific. And I just learned that the Oregon constitution or originally had provisions against Chinese folks that, you know, live in Oregon. So they had to pay $50 a year to the government. They couldn't vote, just... they, could, they couldn't own property and they couldn't do mining. And, you know, a lot of uh, the Chinese that moved here kind of in the 1800s were working on the railroad or in, in mines. Right. So even um... in Oregon, you know, that history has kind of been, been baked in. Um, so, you know, I think what we're working on is really kind of like systemically, like how, how do we address that and, you know, make sure Oregon is a, as a you know, welcoming and inclusive place for all. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's shocking when you hear those things. It's like with the, you know, the Black community, how, you know, so much we've learned in the last year that most of us or a lot of us didn't know about the history of our state and how we, how we treated the Black community and, and then finding out it, it's not just them. <laughs> it's Absolutely. not just them. Um, yes. Uh, how, what, what is the relationship between um, the Asian community and the Black community? Is, is there's uh, some solidarity there? Um, or, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, that that is what we strive towards. You know, I think, you know, what we're all working towards is, you know, how do we address white supremacy and mm -hmm. the way it's kind of played out through our, our histories? So like an example of like our approach now to, to Asian hate crimes, like, now, first say like last year, what the Department of Justice here in Oregon, they tracked 500 incidents of hate against um, black folks and 100 against Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. So it's really been a spike this year. Yeah. And, you know, we're just talking about this issue because it's relatively new mm -hmm. for Asian Americans. Um, but, you know, for like black communities that happens, you know, much more regularly and much yeah. more consistently. Um, so our policy response is really kind of, you know, focused on, addressing hate and, um, you know, not, not from just an Asian American pers perspective, but, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, include all communities in that response right, as well? Right. Um, so one example is like, you know, I don't believe we're going to be able to enforce our way out of hate crimes. Like, I don't think people no. that perpetrate that are like, oh, I, I might get extra jail time if I commit a hate crime. That doesn't right. really um, prevent future hate crimes, does it? Right, right. So, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, having a substantial police presence that you know, other communities might feel differently about, right? Like, you know, we just had the verdict that came out last week, 
And, you know, we all know that, you know, the black experience with police is much different. Um, mm-hmm. So we're not supporting like, you know, a, a bunch more police. We're really looking for ways to like invest in the community so that the community can, can um, you know, have safe places to live and jobs and, you know, safe transportation. And I think that's yeah. really what, what leads to a, a better sense of safety in community. Yeah. Yeah. Not feeling safe in your own community is, is a darn shame. That's <laughs> what it is. Absolutely. You know, yes. it, it's just, it's just not the way it should be. Your home should be your home. Um, well, so let me backtrack a little bit to what we were talking about be, uh, before you talked a little bit about the history about what white community can do. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. No, that was that was me. So go ahead. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I think first it's just like, you know, encouraging um, folks to, to learn more about the history. And we're also looking for, uh, people that are interested to take this training um, and it's um, on a website called ihollaback.org. Um, it's a bystander training. So it'll like talk up through kind of like the, the steps and considerations for when you see incidents of hate and bias, like how do you interrupt it and how do you do to, to support that person that's experiencing that. Um, so yeah, I think that's yeah, something that, you know, all, you know, kind of white folks that are, you know, interested in racial justice can do is like, how do you, you know, stand up for against these incidents? I think that's the main thing that white people that I've talked to have, have in common is that even though we perhaps never felt like we were racist, there were times we didn't stand up when we should have. And I think that's, um, that's been the hardest thing I think for a lot of people is just, you know, to be able to do it and feel safe doing it. And sometimes you're not going to feel safe doing it, but it's the right thing to do. Um, yeah, that, so we can find that information on the website about that, that training. You do a lot of policy work, don't you? A lot of advocacy work and, and yeah, uh, that's, policy. Yeah, that's a major portion of our work. Yes. Yeah, it is, it is. So what, what, is, what is out there right now that you're working on currently as far as um, policy work? Well, you, you know, I think we're, we're thankful to the federal delegation for, for having the COVID hate crimes bill pass, you know, in, in Congress. Yeah. Um, so it got, you know, strong bipartisan support, you know, yeah, it, that, surprisingly strong. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. There's one, one no vote right. in, in right. who that is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I think the statewide level, you know, we're working with our statewide delegation to, to really kind of invest more in, um, like a hotline maybe for, uh, folks that are experiencing hit and bias incidents. Like right now, you know, you can call the department of justice to, to report it, but then I think there is, kind of some missing steps where, you know, like you could access additional resources, whether it's like, you know, victim support funds or mental health resources or things like that. Right. Um, and having that maybe not at the, you know, at the government level, but you know, at a community level. Um, something maybe a little less intimidating than calling the federal government. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, that, that that's a resource we're looking for. And then again, you know, looking for, additional investments overall in kind of the Asian Pacific Islander community. You know, we're the, the fastest growing demographic in the state. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the nonprofit ecosystem hasn't really caught up in terms of like, the supports that the community needs. Okay. Um, you know, so more investment in affordable housing or economic development, yeah. workforce development. Like those are things that, you know, those are investments that create stronger, more resilient communities. And we really need that here in Oregon. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, I know you have some really good partners in that. I know you work with the Rosewood Initiative and, and, and others that, um, that are working in the right direction. Um, yeah. You also mentioned that, um, you know, supporting, I can't remember how you said that, but the economic development, you, you take a special interest in the Jade District um, and do a lot of, of work there. Is, would that be a big help for more people to to support the businesses in the Jade District. I mean, I no, imagine, absolutely. I imagine yeah. that's an area where that was probably hit pretty hard. Um, by the, by yeah, the I mean, we've we've definitely seen, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, kind of early on, even before kind of the shutdown orders in Oregon, you know, they saw like 30 to 60% decline in business because people were afraid to come out or, you know, um, eat Chinese food, basically. Um, oh so, it's, so it's been... <laughs> It's been, um, you know, a challenging year. So, you know, I think, you know, t- ordering takeout and, you know, patronizing the businesses, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that'd be, you know, a great thing for folks to do yeah, as well. Yeah. And also extremely delicious. Yes, yes, it is. It is. Yeah. I think that's a, that's an, it's an easy first step to take 
if nothing else. So um, you're, uh, when you're, you're working on your policies, is there, um, what, what is your, your main focus in your policy work? Is, it, is, it, is, there, is there a main focus in your policy work? Um, you know, I think it's, it's really kind of meeting the, the needs of a community at the moment. Whatever's going um, on then that. Yeah, so I don't think there's a main focus. You know, I think we, we really believe in like um, strategies and approaches and we're not like an issue-based organization. Yeah. I think, you know, we invest deeply in like leadership development, uh, community organizing, advocacy, you know, research. Um, so I think those are kind of like the strategies we use, but we don't really, we're not like, we only do housing or transportation. Or, right, right. It's pretty know. much a holistic approach to, to the community. Right. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So is there anything that you would like us to take away from our conversation with you? Is there anything that you think um, as a community we need to know that we haven't touched on or um, anything you want us to know about Apano? Um, gosh, I think, you know, I would just end by saying that, you know, words really do matter. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think earlier on in, in the pandemic when people were making jokes about, you know, the Wu flu or the Kung flu, yeah, like, you know, that, that wasn't taken as seriously. And we've really seen that, that emboldens and enables, you know, people to, to take action. And, yeah. you know, like we saw in January with the, the insurrection at the Capitol, you know, That's that sense. like words do matter and they, they can incite people to, to violence and it's happening, you know, in DC and in, in cities across America. So I think, yeah, yeah just- um, yeah, Somebody is going to take that seriously and, and run with it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, words do matter. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you, Duncan. I really appreciate your time and um, I appreciate all the work that, that Apano is doing. So thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're welcome. And to all of you um, watching out there, please be safe, be healthy, and do what you can to make this a better, healthier, safer, and inclusive community. Thanks for watching this episode of Community Hotline. Please share the information you've learned with your friends and neighbors. Until next time, this is Monica Weitzel.